some things in life can be easily overlooked. Take, for instance, the writing in a birthday card given to a child. Perhaps you can recall the experience of a relative giving you a birthday card when you were younger and you opened the envelope and you made your way to the card and you gave a kind of courtesy glance to the writing that was either handwritten or pre-printed and you just looked because you wanted to see was there a gift card in there for me? How much is that check worth or how much cash is in here? And you probably did that. I think most of us have, have done that at some point in our lives. And I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip or anything like that but maybe at some point you overlooked some precious words that were written to you. Maybe not from your long-lost aunt from Moldova who saw you like once in a blue moon and decided to, she's not necessarily going to decide to tell you how much you mean to her and you made such a difference in her life, but maybe some of your closer kin shared their sentiments in the card. We can do that kind of thing when it comes to things that we've experienced or things that we're familiar with. I think more often familiarity does not breed contempt as much as it does an increasing proclivity towards negligence. And we want to avoid that temptation when we come into Paul's first epistle to Timothy. Because if you're a Christian and if you've read through the New Testament before, you might be tempted in your fallen frame to shift into autopilot when we come to Paul's greetings. Because you might think to yourself, okay, this has the usual components that I, was, that I would expect at the beginning of a letter. It has the sender, i.e. the author. It has the recipient, and it has a kind of salutation and a blessing right at the beginning. I want to shift into the body of the letter, where the content really is, as though the Spirit's inspiration was precluded from the opening verses. We don't want to make that mistake this morning. I know... When it comes to Paul's greetings, we can treat them like a kind of introduction or preface to a book. And I don't know about you, but I can remember plenty of times in my life when I would just skip through the pages that had Roman numerals on the bottom of them, you know, with introduction or preface, and I would get right to the pages that began with numbers, like number one. Okay, that's where I start reading the book. You don't want to treat Paul's epistle like this. I mean, if you do that with regular, non-inspired books, you can miss some important background and context. And if you treat verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy like that, you will definitely be missing some important background and context. We'll see that as we get into the text shortly. I think today we're only going to make our way through verse 1, if we make our way through verse 1, and you're going to see why that is as we get into the text. Um, Having provided a little bit of an introduction last week where we argued for Paul's authorship of not only this epistle, but all of the pastoral epistles. When I refer to the pastoral epistles, I mean 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So last week we made a case for Paul's authorship, and we also did a little bit of setting the scene for the occasion for Paul's first epistle to Timothy. You remember that Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. Timothy was appointed by Paul to stay in Ephesus, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, so that he might instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Because strange doctrines, as you're going to see in the coming weeks, had crept into the church at Ephesus. What Paul had said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 happened. He told them that from among yourselves, men are going to rise up, perverse men, and they're going to seek to draw away the disciples unto themselves. And it happened, just like Paul said it would. And now Timothy is there. Paul has gone to Macedonia at this point, and he's left Timothy there to, in essence, correct what needed to be corrected and to set in order what needed to be put in order. That's the occasion, and there's a lot more to it, and you're going to see as we get into studying this epistle. But right now, we make our way into the actual text. We begin in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, where we read, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. Now this letter begins as did most letters in the Greco-Roman world with the writer identifying himself. You know, nowadays, if you get a letter from someone, you usually know who it is because you see the return address on the envelope. If you were just to receive a letter, what you would typically have to do is you'd look to the end before you read the beginning so you could see who wrote you the letter lest you engage in some kind of mysterious um, trial of some sort to kind of figure out who it is. You have to appreciate the logical structure that is found in Paul's letters. He begins his letter not with identifying the recipient, not with providing a salutation and a blessing. Those will come after. He begins by identifying himself as the addresser. 
Paul. Very first word of this epistle. Now at this point, I do think a bit of biography is prudent. Paul was a rising star in Judaism, if you will. And if you don't know who Saul was, then you don't really know who Paul was. Both one and the same person, you're going to see that in a moment. But I think to appreciate who the Apostle Paul was, you have to first see who Saul was. Both the same person, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But Paul was formally known by his Hebrew name, Saul. In the book of Acts, we are first introduced to him at the end of Acts chapter 7, verse 58. We're first introduced to him there. He's identified as Saul. And then, as you go on through the book of Acts, all the way up until Acts chapter 13, verse 7, he is repeatedly identified as Saul. He's not identified as Paul up until Acts 13, verse 7, where we read, But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him. So Paul, or Paulus in the Greek, does not appear to be some name that Paul took upon himself to say, you know what, I'm tired of being that old man who I was. I'm not going to be Saul anymore. I am now the Apostle Paul. It appears that was his name. He had both names, which isn't uncommon in the scriptures. We see that. He was Saulus. He was Saul. That was his Hebrew identification. But he was also known as Paul, which wouldn't be strange given the fact that he was born as a Roman citizen. He was born in Tarsus of Cilicia. And Cilicia was a cosmopolitan location in the, province of, in the province of Cilicia, but it was a Roman city. So we know he had Roman citizenship, and his name was Saul, yes, his Hebrew name. And he wore that name probably very proudly. You're going to see in a moment when he talks about his upbringing and he talks about his heritage, that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And he probably loved wearing the name Saul. But... After that point, after Acts 13.7, he's never referred to again as Saul, not in the book of Acts, nor in the epistles. He is routinely referred to as, and repeatedly, and only referred to as Paul, which was a name that was best suited for his work among the Gentiles. Remember, he was an apostle to the Gentiles, so it would fit that he would wear his Greek name. Now, a little side note here. Some think that the name Paulos that his parents gave to him, most likely at his birth, which means small, was some indicator of Paul's small stature. Which would be kind of ironic, if you think about it, because then his Hebrew name is Saul, and Saul stood head and shoulders above everyone else in Israel, so he was a pretty tall guy. But then maybe, maybe his parents named him Paul because he was of a small stature. Interestingly, in a uh, late second century writing, which, note, is not spirit-inspired, It is not biblical, and in some cases it's clearly anti-biblical, called the Acts of Paul and Thelka, which sounds like some bad spin-off of the Spirit-inspired text of Scripture. So somebody in the late 2nd century created this writing, but they do say this. In there, Paul is described as, quote, a man of little stature, thin-haired upon the head, crooked in the legs, and of good state of body, with eyebrows joining, a nose somewhat hooked, full of grace. For sometimes he appeared like a man, and sometimes he had the face of an angel. It's an interesting description. It's a mixture of both flattering on some levels. You're like, wow, that's pretty flattering. On some levels, you're like, not flattering at all. Um, interestingly, Louis Burkhoff, in his writing, uh, the introduction to, an introduction to the New Testament, he notes that John of Antioch preserved a similar tradition and added that Paul was, quote, round-shouldered and had a mix of pale and red in his complexion and an ample beard. Now, we do know this from the text of Scripture. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, Paul had said that his adversaries said of him, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So we don't really know, biblically speaking, much about Paul's appearance, but we do know this. He's not Absalom, and he wasn't Absalom, who was the most handsome man in all of Israel. You can see 2 Samuel 14, verse 25, and that's an encouragement for those of us who may not feel that handsome. You could be used by God in a mighty way, even if you are small in stature, etc. Well, speaking of Paul... He was a man that came to believe the good news of the gospel. To use language from Philippians 3, verse 3, he rejoiced in Jesus Christ, and he had no confidence in the flesh. But he did at one point have a lot of confidence in the flesh. 
If you look at Philippians 3, he speaks about how if anybody could have confidence in the flesh, i.e. confidence that their fleshly performance, their fleshly adherence to the law would merit them some sort of righteous standing before God, he thought, it's me. If there's anyone who could do that, it's me. He begins in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, saying that he was circumcised on the eighth day. So that was in accordance with Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. So as soon as he came out of the womb, he was obeying the word of God, if you will. He was of the stock of Israel. He goes on to say that in chapter 3, verse 5. So he would have likely said with other Jews of his day, I have Abraham as my father. Or maybe he erroneously thought just because he was physically connected to Abraham that he would be an heir of all the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. So... He said that. He goes on to say that he was of the stock of Israel. Of the stock of Israel. Kind of the same idea there of the stock of Israel. And he he says after that that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Which, interestingly, despite its association with infamy. You can see Judges 19. You can see the failed kingship of Saul. Nonetheless, the tribe of Benjamin was still a rather um, prestigious tribe in the kingdom of Israel. And he also goes on to say that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, likely meaning that he wasn't some sort of half-breed like the Samaritans were. He was of good Hebrew stock through and through. So that was the the reasons for fleshly confidence that he had just by virtue of his birth. But then he goes on and he said that as to the law, he was a Pharisee. The last part of Philippians chapter 3 verse 5. Which Paul in his testimony to Agrippa said, it was the strictest of all the sects of Judaism. He says that in Acts chapter 26 verse 5. Concerning zeal, he said that he had demonstrated that by being a persecutor of the church. Philippians 3 6. A fact that we'll consider shortly. And concerning the righteousness which is in the law, he said he was blameless. Which essentially meant that he offered the proper offerings that were due. He gave scrupulous attention to the details of the law, even though he neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, per Matthew 23, 23. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're introduced to him in the seventh chapter of Acts, the latter portion of it, Acts chapter 7, verse 58. There we see Saul, a.k.a. Paul, holding the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. So he participated in the stoning of the Lord's disciple Stephen by holding the coats of those who were throwing stones at Stephen as though to say, you know what, let me hold that for you, gentlemen. This way you can wind up and throw those stones as hard as you can. Shortly after that, in Acts chapter 8... We're told that there was a great persecution that broke out against the church, and we find that Saul, quote, made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. In his defense before Agrippa, he put it this way, And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them, often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. So what was happening on that faithful day on the Damascus Road when Paul's life was interrupted by the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was happening on that day was an isolated occurrence. Paul had persecuted Christians to foreign cities before. This was, if you will, business as usual for the rising star who was exceeding beyond many of his contemporaries in Judaism, per Galatians 1.14. This was business as usual for him. But that day, business as usual wouldn't continue as usual. That day his life got interrupted. On that day, a day like no other, while he was on the road to Damascus, he encountered encountered the risen Christ. That day, he found out that he wasn't only persecuting Christians, but he was persecuting Jesus. On that day, when he asked the question, Who are you, Lord? He found out that Jesus is Lord. And even though he wouldn't get all the details of his mission that day, he'd get more details when he went to Damascus. But nonetheless, on that day, he found that his life had been redirected, and it was a new mission that awaited him. According to his testimony before Agrippa, he said that Jesus said to him, But get up and stand on your feet, 
For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That was the day Paul's life was redirected. He had zealously been climbing the pharisaical ladder only to find out that it was leaning upon the wrong building. He thought he was zealously serving God and he found out that his whole life was in direct opposition to God. Now that bit of biography should remind you of your own. If you are a Christian, you can likely recall how the ladder of your life and your hope for heaven was leaning, if you will, upon the wrong building. And although I doubt you were chasing Christians to persecute them unto death, no doubt you were chasing something. Whether it was the notoriety among men, whether it was pleasure or relationships, whether it was money or power, you were chasing something until your life got graciously interrupted. I do think Paul's biography should remind us of our own. Even as he was captured by the grace of God, if you have come to Christ, you know that you've been captured by the grace of God. You may not have seen yourself as the best person in the world, but you erroneously thought that you were good enough to get into heaven. You might have been, I don't know, ethnocentric and arrogant. You might have been shame-ridden or self-justifying, whatever it was. When the gospel of Christ shone into your heart, you came running out of your grave into newness of life with your sins forgiven and your life redirected. Paul's life got redirected. If you continue on in that Acts chapter 9 narrative, you find that as he goes to a disciple's house who's named, or as he meets a disciple, and it doesn't go to his house necessarily, Ananias, but as he meets this disciple, Ananias, Ananias prays for him. These scales fall off of Paul's eyes. He is baptized in water. He's also filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he's with the disciples in Damascus. And shortly after that point, he's already in the synagogues making the case that Jesus is the Son of God, making the case that Jesus was the Christ. You see that in Acts chapter 9, verse 20, Acts chapter 9, verse Verse 22. He already got to work. In Galatians, he says that the Christians in Judea, they didn't see his face for a while because he was then in Arabia and then he was in Tarsus and Cilicia. And the people in Judea didn't see him for a while. But this is what he said. They glorified God in me because they heard that he who once tried to destroy the faith was preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So God got glory through the life change that he wrought in Saul. Now granted, God is not calling you to be an apostle to the Gentiles like He called the Apostle Paul, but He nonetheless deserves and is going to and probably already has gotten glory from your life when people see the life change that the Spirit of God has wrought in you. And you're not the Apostle Paul, and I'm not the Apostle Paul, but may it be said of you like it was said of him that people glorified God in you when they see that you're not the person you once were or when they see the progressive change when you look less like yourself and more like Jesus Christ, whose image you're being conformed to. Amazing. When you read Paul's story, I do think you should be reminded of your own story. When you say, wow, God forgave him of those sins? He was persecuting the church? He was doing those things? He held the coats of those who were stoning Stephen? He cast his vote to see Christians, followers of Christ, put to death? You should then not stop there. You should say, wow, he's forgiven my sins? He's forgiven all my thoughts. He's forgiven my actions. He's already forgiven my future deeds by virtue of what He's paid for on the cross. Just like the Lord told the children of Israel when He said to them in Deuteronomy 5.15, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So every believer ought to remember where they've come from, what they once were, and what they've been forgiven of. Because he who's been forgiven much, loves much. And everyone who has been forgiven, has been forgiven much. Much more than we even know. But the idea is, do you know that you've been forgiven of much more than you know? Well, Paul goes on. And as the greeting continues, we find out that he would not only go from being a persecutor of the faith to a preacher of the faith, but he would go from being a Pharisee, and now we're back to the text, to an apostle of Christ Jesus by the commandment of God. 
to use language from George Knight, with that identification, Paul said whose apostle he was and the basis for that apostleship. Before we move forward, I do think it's important to ask and answer this question. What, in a general sense, and in a strict sense, what was an apostle? What was an apostle? Well, in a general sense, an apostle was, again to quote George Knight, one who was sent with the authority of and on behalf of the one sending. So an apostle was an authoritative and an authoritative envoy and a representative in a general sense. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, in the strictest sense of its New Testament use. Meaning that he was personally selected by the Lord Jesus Christ to be his authoritative communicant and his instrument whereby he would communicate not only to the first century and the first generation of Christians, but he would be a means of the revelation of God to subsequent generations as he penned the canon of Scripture, at least 13 epistles that are referred to as the Pauline epistles of Scripture. He would lay down what is normative revelation for all generations. By normative, I mean a rule of law, an authoritative, God-inspired rule of law. He was an apostle in the strictest sense. He was not one of the 12 apostles. I think most of you know that. From which Judas forsook his office and he was replaced by Matthias. You see that in Acts chapter 1 verses 25 and 26. And note this, the criteria that was used to replace Judas with eventually Matthias was specific criteria to replace the office that Judas abandoned. You can see that in Acts chapter 1 verses 21 and 22. Paul was not an apostle in the sense that he was strictly a representative of a local church in the way that Epaphroditus is referred to as an apostle. In most of your translations, Philippians 2.25, Epaphroditus is referred to as a messenger. But specifically in the Greek, he's called the Philippians apostolos. Paul was not an apostle strictly in that sense. He was an apostle in the most strictest sense. He was personally selected and commissioned by Jesus Christ on equal authoritative footing with the likes of Peter and John. See Galatians 2. He was Christ's sent one. Now if you were to tell me that you are an apostle, I would give you at least four reasons why you're not an apostle. And we'll get there in a moment. But even though you are not going to communicate, at least for the first time, uh, normative revelation and you're not going to communicate new and normative revelation to the church you and I are called to give and communicate the already given normative revelation of God so no you are not an ambassador of Christ in the same way that Paul was an apostle but note this and don't forget this it's so important you are a living epistle to be read of all men you are an ambassador of that sense you are Christ's epistle with the ink of the Spirit written upon your heart, you are to be read by all men. And what people read of you is often what they'll see of Christianity. It's kind of like the story of Henry Stanley. Henry Stanley was a reporter for the New York Herald. He was given the assignment to go to Africa and gather what news he could concerning the missionary David Livingston. People, haven't heard, people hadn't heard of David Livingston for a while. They wanted to know, at least the guy who's in charge of the Herald sent out um, Henry Stanley to find out what he's doing. Get us some data, get us some information about him. So he sent out Henry Stanley. And he went, and upon arriving in Africa, he found that things weren't going to be easy for him. According to one article, he was, quote, swindled by native guides, threatened by belligerent kings, and brought to the verge of the grave by dysentery. Now all that, and he couldn't find David Livingston's whereabouts. He's looking for this missionary and can't find him. He began to wonder whether or not David Livingston was actually real or whether he was a myth. About two months after declaring his hopelessness of even being able to find David, David Livingston, he was led to the camp and the place where he was. When he was led to that village, he heard the famed missionary's voice saying in English, How do you do, sir? And Stanley offered what has become the famous response, Dr. Livingston, I presume. He had indeed found Dr. Livingston. And per his own words, he described the effect that Livingston's life had on him 
in clear and no uncertain terms. In words spoken to a newspaper correspondent, he said, In 1871, I went to Africa as prejudiced as the biggest atheist in London. But there came for me a long time for reflection. I was out there, away from a worldly world. I saw a solitary old man there and asked, Why on earth does he stop here? Is he cracked or what? What is it that inspires him? For months after we met, I simply found myself listening to him, wondering at him as he carried out all that was said in the Bible, leave all that ye have and follow me. But little by little, his sympathy became contagious. Seeing his piety, his gentleness, his zeal, his earnestness, and how quietly he did his duty, I was converted by him, though he had not tried to do it. Now, while some can appropriately question the soundness of Stanley's conversion when looking at some of the historical controversies that surrounded him, and while it seems unlikely that David Livingston never tried to convert him, the point for our consideration is this. Look at the way David Livingston's life was read by this man. It's like I watched him. It's like I studied him. I see his gentleness. I see his zeal. And according to Henry Stanley, at least, he's saying, I was converted in light of what I saw from him. And there are people that I know, there are Christians that I know, who would say, you know what, I knew the gospel, but when I saw the way that the gospel was real in the work of somebody else's life, it's as though God used that to awaken my heart to believe the Spirit-inspired Word of God. And sometimes that's what God will do. Some people who have heard it and they've seen maybe hypocrisy or they've seen staleness or indifference or apathy, when all of a sudden they see the Spirit of God awaken somebody and change somebody, they take notice and they say, you know what, this is real. And maybe in the providence of God, He uses that as a means by which He brings them to saving faith in the Word of the Gospel. Now whether or not that happened for Henry Stanley, I don't know, but according to Henry Stanley, he thought it did. But I can tell you that I know that that's been the story of other people, some of whom are in this room. And it's amazing to think that you could be a means through which people see the reality of the power of the gospel. Not just necessarily in your initial conversion, but maybe in the change that continues to happen. Because I think some people get discouraged sometimes. They say, you know what? My conversion isn't going to be as radical as the Apostle Paul's was. Okay, that's fine. But is your life continuously changing in such a way that if somebody who hasn't seen you in three years were to see you three, three years gone from that first time or that time, the last time they saw you, would they say, wow, I see differences. I see greater measures of humility, greater outworkings of love, greater measures of zeal, greater measures of... Christ being exhibited in your character. Don't downplay the way that God can use that. No, you're not an ambassador in the same way that the Apostle Paul was, but you are a living epistle to be read of all men. And you're not going to bear witness of Jesus in the same exact way, at least to the degree and the specific calling that Paul was given, but you will nonetheless bear witness of Jesus in the way that you speak and act. Now, concerning the office of apostle, back to the text, Paul says that he was an apostle of Christ Jesus. I do want to make this note concerning the cessation of that office. I'd be among those who would argue that the office of apostleship was not intended to be an ongoing office. As though we could say, you know what, so-and-so in this room, he's called to be an apostle. And the reasons why I would argue that are at least found in these four reasons, and it's good for you to know. Number one, the apostles and prophets formed the foundation of the New Testament church. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, they are referred to, the apostles and prophets. You'll see, if you look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5, that they communicated revelation from God, new revelation from God. They had insights into the mystery of the gospel and the mystery of Christ's calling to go out to the Gentiles, uh, his apostles to go out to the Gentiles, and so on. That was a foundational work that was done in that first century. And the church has been continued continue to be built upon that foundation. You don't continue to lay the foundation over and over again. It's not that we're 2,000 years removed from the day of Pentecost, give or take, and that foundation is still being laid. The foundation was laid, and now it's being built upon. But I want to add to that by saying that early church history witnesses to this fact as well. 
I think the Word of God speaks for itself, and we are going to make more of a case using the Word of God, but I do want to appeal to early church history for a moment. In the longer version of Ignatius' epistle to the Magnesians, um, the shorter version might be more authentic, but the longer version might be as well. Sometimes the shorter version of the epistles of the church fathers are judged to be more authentic, but nonetheless, um, in his writing, he said that Paul and Peter were laying the foundations of the church. Now, Irenaeus, no, he's, he's writing early, early, early 2nd century. That's Ignatius' epistle to the Magnesians. Writing later on, Irenaeus likewise wrote in the 3rd chapter of his work against heresies, he spoke of Paul and Peter, again, quote, laying the foundations of the church. So that is also later on in the 2nd century. Now you go on to early 3rd century, Tertullian in the 23rd chapter or 21st chapter of his work, The Five Books Against Marcion, he makes reference to, quote, the time of the apostles, close quote, which if you read on, he says, was in conjunction with the life of the 1st century apostles. So I just say that to say, when you look at the text, they were the foundation of the New Testament church, the apostles and prophets. So that speaks for itself from the text. But then you have early church history saying, yeah, that was the time of the apostles. Paul and Peter were laying the foundation. It's not continuously being laid. Point number two would be this. Leaving aside the unique qualifications that were required to fulfill Judas's office. You see that in Acts chapter 1, 21 and 22. Paul affirmed his apostleship by appealing to the fact that he had seen the risen Lord, 1 Corinthians 9, 1, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. A qualification shared among all the apostles. He, uh, he said that he had directly been appointed to the apostleship by Christ and God the Father, and that the miraculous signs of an apostle were done through him, 2 Corinthians 2, 12. And then you can see other texts as well. That's what made, part of what made the unique calling of an apostle in that first century. Number three, and this is important as well, Paul appears to suggest that he was the last apostle in the strictest sense of the term when after enumerating the post-resurrection appearances of Christ, he wrote, quote, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Now, it's not as explicit as maybe the other arguments, but nonetheless, the appeal is there. That he's appeared to these people and he appeared to those people and then last of all he appeared to me as a kind of aberration, as one untimely born. Not as though it would be a kind of regular occurrence throughout history. And number four, and this is also important to note, while Peter and the other apostles saw to it that Judas' office would be fulfilled and replaced... Namely, it was ultimately fulfilled by Matthias. We don't see the apostles do that any longer after, say, Acts chapter 12 when James is martyred. The early church doesn't go about and say, okay, James was martyred. Okay, now we need someone else to fill James's spot. It was a unique spot that was filled because Judas forsook his office. But when any of the apostles were martyred, we don't see the other apostles saying, okay, we've got to get another apostle to stand in the gap and to fill his spot. We don't see that. Apostles were specifically selected by the Lord Jesus Christ in the strictest sense. And that's what the Apostle Paul was. Those are the reasons why I believe and would argue that that office is not still being filled today. It was filled. It's part of the foundation of the church. Back to the text. So in Paul's opening greeting, we see that he wrote that he was, quote, an apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus. Okay, so Paul didn't have a career objective to be an apostle. You know, he didn't go to some ministry fair and then sign up for it. He was an apostle of Christ Jesus according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus. That's interesting language for Paul to use at the beginning of his letter to Timothy. Kind of strong language. I'm an apostle according to the commandment of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. He doesn't use the usual phrase that we see him use. Oftentimes in Paul's letters, he opens up by saying that he was an apostle by the will of God. We see that in quite a few of his letters. But here, it's a stronger term. He uses the expression, according to the commandment of God, focusing, if you will, on the outward expression of the divine will. It adds a sense of forcefulness to it which you'd be surprised about in a personal letter to Timothy. You're not surprised when you open Paul's letter to the church of Galatia, the churches of Galatia, and you see what he writes there. There the gospel was in jeopardy 
And Paul opens up in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, and he says that he was an apostle not from men nor through a man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. A strong statement of his apostleship in the beginning of Galatians. And they needed it because they were drifting from the gospel. They started adding works to grace. Started thinking that one was justified by keeping the law and getting circumcised as well as faith in Jesus Christ. But why here? Did Timothy, needed, did Timothy need to be reminded of Paul's apostleship? No. Well, maybe in a certain sense, but Timothy was on board with Paul's apostleship. So why did Paul add such a strong greeting at the beginning? I think he did it because this was more than a letter between two friends. This was more than a letter between two co-workers. This was more than a letter between an apostle and someone whom he regarded as his spiritual son. This letter was meant to be written to, meant to be read to the church at Ephesus. Remember last week, we looked at the last verse of each of the pastoral epistles. And when Paul writes words like, grace be with you all, it's plural. It'd be like the Spanish, ustedes, right? It's a plural you. Grace be with you all, which gives us a hint that it wasn't just meant for Timothy. This was meant for the church at Ephesus. And in Ephesus, they were drifting from the gospel. Instead of cleaving to the gospel of grace, they started talking about these mysteries and genealogies. And then you had teachers of the law who were using the law unlawfully. And they were preaching this kind of false asceticism. And they were preaching a kind of, or living a kind of licentiousness. The gospel was at stake. So when Paul tells Timothy that he's an apostle, according to the commandment of God our Savior, the reason why he's using such strong language is because, again, the gospel is at stake. And this letter was not just meant for Timothy. This letter was meant to bolster and fortify, if you will, the authority that Timothy had as Paul's apostolic delegate. So when this letter was read publicly, all of those in Ephesus would know, grace be with you all, plural, all the people were going to hear it read. They would know Paul was affirming Timothy as a genuine son in the faith and as his apostolic representative. And if they were questioning Paul's apostleship like the people in Galatia did, Paul was opening right up, right out the gates with stating no. I'm an apostle according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our Lord, which I do think would also be a tremendous encouragement for Timothy as well. Timothy's job was hard in Ephesus. You're going to see that as we go through. I can't wait, Lord will, until next week to talk more about this young man so you get to know him better because I think he'll be an inspiration to you. And the job that he got assigned to in Ephesus was a hard one. And it was probably encouragement to him to read the words of the Apostle Paul saying that it's Paul writing to you, Timothy, and it's not just mentor Paul. This is Paul, an apostle according to the commandment of God. So when he was being charged by the Apostle Paul, he could be reminded that he was also, in a sense, being charged by God, encouraged by God, and fortified by God as God spoke through his Apostle. Amazing. Um, I do also think we should take note of the commandment's origin. I often point out these things because it's so important to notice all the implicit witnesses to the deity of Jesus found in the scripture. Notice where this commandment came from. Paul was an apostle according to what? The commandment of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope. I think that's an implicit witness to the deity of Jesus that he is sharing co-equal authority with the Father. If he was just some kind of finite human being, there's no way that the apostolic command or the call to have somebody be an apostle would come from God and this human. <laughs> but he was more than just a man. He was fully man, but he was also the God-man. Son of God and God the Son. So I do think here in the title, in the opening greeting, I should say, you do see an implicit witness to Jesus' deity and the commandment's origin. Now two things I want us to notice here is how... Paul describes God. He describes Him as our Savior. Now what's interesting is, if you go through Paul's epistles, this is the first time that he refers to God the Father as Savior. He will refer to God the Father as Savior in uh, 2 Timothy, and he will refer to Him as Savior in uh, Titus. So we'll see that there, at least specifically um, in Titus, we see it quite a few times. But up until this point, he's referred to Jesus as the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5.23. And in his letter to the church of Philippi, he said that our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is the first time we see that designation for the Father. 
Now, in 2 Timothy, Paul refers to Jesus as Savior. And I should say that there. And in Titus, we see designations for both God the Father and Christ as Savior. But here in this epistle, note this. Three times, he refers to God the Father as Savior. Why? Why, why that emphasis here? God the Father is identified as Savior in other places. Old Testament and New Testament. Sometimes explicitly, sometimes it's the resulting connotation from what's said. For instance, in Deuteronomy 32 verse 5, Yahweh is called the Rock of Salvation. The psalmist said that the people in Egypt forgot God their Savior. Psalm 106 21. The Lord said through Isaiah, I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. Isaiah 43 11. Even in the New Testament, while the people of God were still under the Old Covenant, Mary exalted the Lord. She said, My soul exalts the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Jude's closing doxology also includes an address to God as the only Savior. So God the Father is referred to as Savior in places, but normally when we think of Savior, we think of Jesus as Savior. But Paul is saying here, well, God the Father, He's also Savior. Why is He doing that? I think there may be at least a couple of reasons why. And it's worth noting, it creates a little bit of context. There was perhaps in the church of Ephesus an attempt to undermine this reality of God the Father being a Savior. One possibility is when we look through 1 Timothy, we see numerous clues that what was going on in Ephesus was a kind of proto-Gnosticism. Gnosticism in its embryonic form. Now, Gnosticism, which comes from the Greek word gnosis, was this false philosophy, false theology, false religion that was essentially a mythology where people were told to seek a higher secret knowledge. One of the tenets of Gnosticism appears to have been to take aims at the God of the Old Testament. And when you look at this epistle, and you're going to see why in the days ahead, I do think we see a bunch of reasons to think that Gnosticism, at least intertwined with elements of Judaism, had infected the church at Ephesus. Now, here's where it comes to God the Father. Here's where the issue comes with God the Father. Uh, Dr. Peter Jones, in his book, The Gnostic Empire, speaks about how the ancient Gnostics took aim at the God of the Old Testament. And he does so by saying this, quote, The ancient Gnostics understood very well that if their system was going to work, they would have to get rid of the God of the Bible. This explains the extremist, anti-creation, and anti-Old Testament sentiment found in certain Gnostic texts. Yaldabaoth an obvious parody of Yahweh, the chief archon, ruler, creator, is vilified and mocked with a disdain bordering on hate. According to one of the recently discovered Gnostic texts from Nag Hammadi, the so-called hypostasis of the archons, God the creator is represented as blind, ignorant, and arrogant, the source of envy and the father of death. He went on to write, creation is interpreted in all, in quote, all Gnostic texts as an act of unspeakable pride on the part of the Demiurge. At least some Gnostics refer to Yahweh as the Demiurge, not the ultimate eternal God, but a kind of lowercase g God, a created God, who is vilified, and in some Gnostic teachings, they assert that he was sinister. Likewise, in the Gnostic writing, the testimony of truth, which is filled with lies, the author, who even postured himself against other noted Gnostics like Valentinius, referred to the Genesis account and declared that God, the God of the Bible, had, quote, shown himself to be a malicious envier. So suffice it to say, Gnosticism, when it evolves into what it would become in the second century, did not think well of God the Father. So I think it stands to reason when we look through 1 Timothy and we see that Timothy was standing up against a false theology, falsely called knowledge, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, and we see elements of Gnostic theology, it stands to reason that also Paul and Timothy were up against a misunderstood view of God the Father, which is why three times in this epistle he calls God Savior, because proto-Gnostic thought rallied against such a notion railed against such a notion. So as to cover other legitimate possibilities, Philip Towner notes that the term Savior was used in the Roman imperial cult for the deified emperor. You see, many commentators refer to the fact that Nero was referred to as Savior. So part of what may be going on here is maybe not only a response to Gnosticism, but almost a response to, also a response to the deification of the Roman emperor, Nero. Nero. 
other Roman emperors, of course, but contemporary speaking, Nero. Well, I do want to say this. And I'll say this in closing, and then we'll pick up at the end of the verse next week. I think Christians must be on guard against any proclivity to divide the God of the New Testament from the God of the Old Testament, as though they're two separate gods. They're not. If you look at the Old Testament and you look at the New Testament alike, you can see mercy, faith, love, and justice on display in the God of the Old Testament. And you see it on display in the God of the New Testament, too. They're the same God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all the way through. But I do think that sometimes Christians can just think of the Son as being their Savior without appreciating the fact that the Father is the Savior as well. That you're not only saved by the offering of the Son, you're saved by the giving and the sending of the Son of the Father. And if you just think of the Father as the one who was pacified by the Son's offering without remembering the fact that the Father was the one who sent the Son so that He would be pacified with the Son's offering, you're missing out on a relational dynamic that you need to have as a Christian. You have to see that your Father demonstrated His love in this. Not that you loved Him, but that He sent His Son as a propitiation, a wrath-appeasing offering for your sins. So yes, you want to cleave to 1 John 3.16. We know love by this, in that Jesus, He laid down His life for us. But they don't want to forget 1 John 4.10. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. And how could you forget John 3.16? God so loved the world that He sent His only Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal, everlasting life. If you know your Heavenly Father, you know that. And you know that He, like Jesus, is your Savior. And then there's Christ who is our hope. You know what? i got to finish this. Because how can we leave that out? Verse 1 ends with the Apostle Paul writing that he was an apostle according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus who is our hope. What an appropriate title and name for the one who is our hope. Notice that he is Christ, Christos. That's not a first name. It's not a last name either. Right? Christ Jesus. Oh, first name, Christ. Oh, I thought that was his last name. No, it's not his last name. It's not his first name. He is Jesus. And the title that he bears is the Christ. He bears many titles, but that's one of them. Christos. Christos means that he was the anointed one. It was essentially the Old Testament equivalent of the Hebrew word Mashiach. Jesus was the ultimate anointed one of God. He was the Messiah. And then there's his name in our text, Jesus. Don't forget what the angel told Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. See, the name Jesus was a fitting name for Jesus. Yesu in the Greek is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Yeshua, Joshua, which means Yahweh is salvation. So fitting to be that name for Jesus. Every time his name was called as a youth, for instance, Jesus or Yeshua, the proclamation was going out, Yahweh saves, Yahweh is salvation. He indeed wears that name well, you could say. And it's because He is Christ and it's because He saves His people from their sins that He is, as the end of this verse says, our hope. Without Jesus Christ, whether one knows it or not, they are without hope. They are hopeless. To use language from Ephesians, without hope in the world. So what happens is when somebody doesn't know Christ and they don't have an assurance of what their eternal destiny will be, what they do in an attempt to anesthetize and kind of numb their minds and their consciences and to pacify their desires and wants, they fill their lives with so many other hopes. You probably know because you were there prior to knowing Jesus. They fill their hopes with the hopes of either advancing in their career, the hope of getting a better job, the hope of getting a spouse, the hope of getting a better spouse, the hope of advancing in their career, as I mentioned, the hope of being more fit for the summer, the hope of traveling to somewhere they hadn't been before or traveling somewhere that they'd like to go. And there's nothing wrong with any of those hopes apart from hoping for a better spouse. You love and honor the spouse that you are with. That's you you to cherish them as a gift from God to you as a covenant partner. But those other hopes, nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. But they aren't meant to take the place of that, the one who should be your ultimate hope. And the one who should be your ultimate hope is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, He ought to be every man and woman's ultimate hope, and He is the Christian's ultimate hope. Notice, by the way, the word our there. 
He is our hope. Just as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father who is in heaven. Speaking of the common familial nature shared among believers as sons and daughters of God, so all believers can say, He is our hope. He's not just my hope. He is my hope, but He's our hope. I'm part of a collective. I'm part of a body. I'm part of a people that He's redeemed. He is our hope. It speaks to, again, the familial nature of the body of Christ and how we all enter, as it were, through one door, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are, I think, a few important things for us to notice in closing regarding this designation. First, let us ask this. Why is He the Christian's hope? Why is Christ our hope? For starters, His person and work. That's the grounds of our hope. Who He is and what He has done. Paul spoke of the hope of the Gospel when he wrote to the church of Colossae. The hope of the Gospel which is the good news and what God did in sending His Son, born of a woman, born of a virgin, under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, by living the perfect life that we can never live and bearing the wrath that would take us all of eternity and we'd still never be able to exhaust it. The good news of the Gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now if your hope is in Him, by the way, remember that you've received this good hope by grace. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. You didn't earn this good hope. You didn't go looking for it. It came looking for you. To use language from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, God, according to His great mercy, caused you to be born again to this living hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. So if you have this hope, you have this hope by grace. You have it because God caused you to be born again to it. And as a result, you look towards the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2.13. You have the hope of eternal life, Titus chapter 3, verse 7. Which do not forget, according to the way that the Bible speaks about the word, the Bible uses the word hope, it's an eschatologically fixed certain thing. It's not a whimsy wish. It's a fixed thing. With the return of Christ, you will receive the hope of righteousness, Galatians chapter 5, verse 5. Meaning you put off that fallen frame and your body is now perfectly righteous. You will have a glorified body, Romans 8.23, fit to rejoice in a glorified creation alongside of a glorified people, forever basking in the realized hope of the glory of God, Romans 5.2. And oh, how this should affect your daily life. This should tremendously affect your daily life. If you see that you have a fixed hope in Jesus, then you know that the God who has promised you a hope beyond what you could even imagine, He's in control of your todays and your tomorrows. And He's promised you a never-ending happy ending, if you will. That should so affect your todays in a great way. You are free, as it were, to live for Christ today because you know that He's promised you forever. So you can live from today. You can give yourself for the glory of God today because Christ is your hope and He's promised you forever. You are free to live without anxiety because the God who promised you an immeasurably joyous eternity controls your days and tomorrows. You are free to think about others and not be self-consumed when you see how God is committed to take care of you. And therefore, if you haven't already... I hope and I pray, even as I say these words, that you confess that your hope for eternal life and the forgiveness of sins is built upon nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. You remember Jeremiah 17.5, Cursed is the man who trusts in man or whose confidence is in the arm of flesh. You don't want your confidence to be in you or your works, your performances. You want your hope to be solely placed upon Jesus Christ. Do not be distracted and anesthetized, having your mind numbed by lesser hopes. Later on in this epistle, Paul writes to Timothy, command those who are rich in this world not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. So don't let things like money or money attaining or any of the other things that I mentioned steal and distract you from that which should be your fixed hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Set all of your hope upon what God did in sending His Son and set your affections on Christ who is our hope. And if Christ is truly your hope, the witness of that fact is found in the fact that the Spirit of God who is in you is reminding you and causing you to rejoice in the hope of glory. Because He's in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory via the Spirit of Christ.
And while he is in you, he not only applies the doctrine of Christ to your heart and mind, but he changes you and he practically purifies you. After all, according to the Apostle John, everyone who has this hope of Jesus' Christ's return and being made like him at Jesus' return, everyone who has this hope purifies himself, even as he is pure. Well, bet you didn't think we were going to go that long for one verse, right? <laughs> so, uh, but we did, and we're going to pray that God would use it, bear fruit from it and through it. Father, we come to you, our God, our Savior, and we come before your throne and we worship you, and we thank you for the one who is Jesus Christ, our hope. Thank you for the abundant mercy with which you begot us again into this living hope when we had set our hopes on so many lesser things, yet you opened our eyes to see the great hope of our Savior and all the blessed hope that is connected to Him and with Him. Thank you, Father. I pray for all of us, Lord, that seeing what you have promised us in the future and seeing what is already ours in the present, that we would be freed up to minister in the ways that you've called us to minister, leveraging our lives for the gospel, even as the Apostle Paul and Timothy leveraged their lives for the gospel. I pray that we would be so enamored with this grace from you, our Savior, our saving God, who has saved us, purchased us with the blood of your Son, freed us, made us new creations, put away our shame, and you've put away our, the wrath that was due to us. In light of who you are, in light of what you've done, we pray that you would cause us to continue to run in the path of your light and your countenance, even as we continue to study through this epistle together. We love you, God our Savior, and we love you, Jesus Christ, our hope. We pray these things to you, Father, in the name of our hope, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.